שבוע טוב. בעזרת השם, we're going to start and before we want to dedicate the class, first of all, for Alon Ben Josephine Dina and Michal Batsara for Shlom Bait, and for Refua Shlema for Yoel Ben Mania and Avraham Chaim Ben Yocheved. Both should have Refua Shlema right away, struggling with a terrible disease. As other Jim should have Refua Shlema right now. So, Bezrat Hashem, exactly in a week from now, we are going to be dressed with costumes and with red noses and eat hamantashen and read the Megillah and celebrate one of the most nicest holidays of the year. The reason why it's one of the most nicest holidays of the year because the whole theme of the holiday is to be happy. I mean, other holidays you have to be serious, you have to be strict. I mean, all the holidays you have to be happy. It says, you have to, to be festive and happy in your holidays. But Purim, the theme is, you know, fun, getting dressed up, getting drunk, having parties. The whole mo theme of the holiday is happiness. Now, we have a very special uh, custom in my school that once a month we have a class about the theme of the month. The power of the month, the, the emotions of the month, what I can achieve in a certain month. Each month is separate and different. So you can go online and find them. They're very, very interesting classes. So since I'm now on tour, we didn't do it the Adar month. Bezrat Hashem, next week, we'll do the class about Adar and we'll go online very fast for you can see. But every month has a certain sense. And the month... The sense of the month of Adar, we mentioned it yesterday, is the sense of, of laughter. And laughter has two, two places, two origins. There's one of them, it comes from a very not good place, from an impure place. And that's when people make jokes and fun on account on other people. And unfortunately, half the humor in the world is making fun at somebody else. And, and people, unfortunately, they, they, they enjoy seeing somebody else suffer. I mean, if you see somebody fall in a very funny way, or a very embarrassing way, most people laugh. They actually make competitions online now who sends the most funniest video of somebody falling. And, and people like that. I mean, you go to places like YouTube and Facebook, the ones who have the most views are the ones when people fall in very w embarrassing ways. So, yeah, you might get a good laugh, but that's not a good laugh. It's not a, a real, real laugh. It's coming from a very impure place. One of the famous Tanaim, the famous sages, Rabbi Akiva, says, A person that constantly is a jokester. Tzchok is like laughter, and Kalut Rosh is like being non, doing nonsense. They bring the person to, to do very impure things, very immodest things. So there's one type of laughter that, that we relate with the most. It's a good joke or a good funny movie. Or, or some situation that makes me laugh. But that's not the real laugh. There's another type of laugh that comes, the origin comes from my soul. And that's the real laugh. And this is not a laugh that I actually necessarily need to sit on the floor and hold my stomach and, and laugh. Rather, it comes from a very, very deep part of my soul. And we mentioned yesterday that there's a certain chapter of Tehilim, we actually read it every time we say Birkat Amazon, that we say, Shir Malot B'Shuv Hashem at Shivat Zion, when we're going to be, be re returned to Israel. It says, B'Shuv Hashem at Shivat Zion, Einu Kecholmim, we would realize that the exile was like a dream. And then we say, Az Yemale Sochok Pino. Then our mouth is going to be filled with laughter. Ul Shonen Urina. And our tongues are going to, all day long, just praise the Kadosh Bechor. Leranen means to praise Him constantly, the Kadosh Boho. So, thank you so much. This is talking about the real laughter, that my soul is so fulfilled that it's happy. I mentioned yesterday that when a person is depressed, it's not because life is hard, and not because he has financial problems, or a sickness, or marital problems. It's because the soul is not happy. I can have all the problems in the world, but if my soul is not happy, I'm never going to be happy. I'm going to be miserable, I'm going to be heavy, I'm going to be upset. That's only because my soul is not happy. 
And if I am happy, sometimes you wake up in the morning and you're all good energy, that's because my soul is happy. Must have been done a, a special mitzvah the night before, or even that day. But the reality is that everything that I experience, it's my soul projecting out, and I'm feeling it. So when I'm excited, it's because my soul gets excited. My soul gets affected by everything around me. Believe it or not, even if it's cold for me, weather-wise, my soul will get affected. Chaz v'shalom, I get burned on my hand, my soul will get affected from the burn. But also on the negative, on the positive part of it, people don't really realize that. You come and tell them, come and pray with us on Shabbat in the morning. Ah, it's too long, it's three hours, and the rabbi keeps talking, and, and then they sell, they start auctioning everything, it's becoming business, and, and everybody talks, and, I don't, and it's three hours. You, you want to let, let me read 120 pages? And you find all the excuses why not to show up. But the thing is that when you come, even if you force yourself to come, and then when you leave, you don't realize that your soul just got a little bit of energy, and such a powerful energy that you don't even notice, but suddenly your mood is better. Suddenly you're not as tired. Suddenly you're not as heavy as you were a day before. You don't attribute it to that. But that's the reality. That you, you're saying, oh, you know, probably, I don't know, the weather's nice, I feel better. The reality is that just that the fact that you sat in a holy place for three hours, and you saw with your own eyes the holy book of the Torah, and you heard with your ears the reading of the Torah, and here and there you said a few amens, and you moved your lips a little bit because you did follow a little bit of the prayer, you injected your soul with energy. Instead of swallowing pills, that that's what half the world do, well, it doesn't matter right now what type of pills, but half the world is swallowing pills every day. Whether it's uh, 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 actual chemicals for anti-depression or whatever it is, or people think that if you take vitamins in a pill, then that's it, then I'm very healthy. They drink two bottles of Diet Coke every day, but they take their vitamins. <laughs> so the vitamins are worthless. Vitamins are in fruit, and vitamins are in vegetables. They're not in a pill. I mean, yeah, I, I, I know doctors and pharmacists, they'll argue with me, no, no, no. Vitamins is in, a, in an orange. Eat the orange. Don't swallow a pill. You want the real sustenance? You go to the original. You don't go to something that is processed. And I'm not taking away from the power of the vitamin, but the point is that for thousands of years, people wanted to get the right vitamins. They would go to the tree and take a, a, a fruit off and not crush it into powder that you don't know what's in it. You might think that there's a lot of good things in it, but there's not. And then psychologically, you think you're feeling better. Probably most of the times that if you would switch it, you would not even notice a difference. And psychologically, you think you're feeling better. And they tested that. They tested that with many different types of medicines. That they put nothing in it. Has a certain name in English. I don't remember the name. Placebo. Placebo, right? Placebo. Placebo? Okay. I knew there was a name in English. And there's nothing there. And they found out that in 50% of the cases, people think that that they got cured, and they just go to show you, it's, not, it's nonsense. So, unfortunately, half the world is popping a pill into their mouth at least once a day. Even in basic things, people have a little bit of a headache, whoop, oh, Tylenol. I have a little bit of pain here, up, oh, another Tylenol. So, uh, this is the sheker, the lie of the world, that I take something small into my system, and it maybe makes an effect. Yeah, if I have a headache and I'll take a Tylenol, it will remove the headache, but it didn't solve the problem. It just numbed the problem. It didn't come and solve the problem that inside of me. It just numbed the nerve. That's it. That's what a Tylenol will do. So I'm not going to feel the pain. And then voila, magic. That's it. No more headache. Really, if I have a headache, it doesn't mean that I need to pop a pill. Rather, it means that most likely I'm either dehydrated, or I was in the sun too much, or I was exposed too much to my radiation from my phone, or I didn't sleep enough, or whatever it is that's causing me to have a headache. Me taking a pill, I'm just numbing the problem. So unfortunately, we all take a lot of pills, and a lot of the pills that we take, it's not in that department. Rather, people, could they go to the vitamin store. It looks like such a good business, this vitamin store. You know, and they buy all the vitamins, and this vitamin is this, is this vitamin is like that. And we think that the happiness or the energy that I get, it comes from the pill. It's not. 
the happen happiness and the energy that I get is from my neshama, from my soul. If I boost my soul with what it needs, it will be happy. I can be in hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, problems from here till Los Angeles. And if my soul gets what it needs, it will be happy. I might have problems. It doesn't mean that my soul is going to solve my problems. But at least I'm happy. And this is the real happiness. This is the laughter that, you, that comes within from the depth of my neshama. And that's the laughter that I want to pull out. I don't want to be laughing. It's very healthy to laugh. It's very good to laugh. But not from nonsense. I want my, my soul to be so fulfilled is that the laughter comes within. And the motion of the month of Adar is this laughter. Meaning that I can tap into it. If there's a certain emotion, we talked about it yesterday, it's a certain energy that I can tap into. Like I compared it yesterday to Black Friday. You have 24 hours of a sale. If you have your coupon and you apply it, then you'll get 90% off. But this Black Friday comes once a year. And you have to be ready. And if I jump on the opportunity, then I will get the deal. Same thing here. Comes an auspicious day, a holiday, Purim, Pesach, Hanukkah, something, Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh, the head of the month. It's an auspicious time. That I only need to do is tap into the energy. If I tap into the energy using certain tools, spiritual tools, of course, then I'm able to draw some energy into my system. So if it's Shabbat, then I have to observe the rules of Shabbat. I can't drive, I can't turn the lights on, I have to do Kiddush, I have to have meals. There's a lot of rules. That, that allows me to tap into the energy. If you want to compare it into technology, look at some of the wires that we use to plug into our machines. So if you have a phone, most of the phones today, it's a one-pin uh, uh, cord. But there are many, very different types of electronics that the pins, you have two, three, five, six, eight. So, for example, now we started streaming a lot of our videos. So we needed a special system, and it has a certain pin that goes into the computer and into the camera. For the ones who might be familiar, it's called HDMI. So it has 16, 16 pins to go into the computer. Now, if it's missing one of the pins, it's not going to work. One of them will break or bend. Now they're making it that the pins are not too many to, to save this headache for whatever reason. But I'm not a technical guy. I don't know why all the reasons. I just see with my own eyes that this particular plug that we bought had 16 pins. One is going to be bent or broken. The system doesn't work. So the same thing with me when I want to tap into a, a holy day. So with Shabbat, there's many pins. 39 to be exact, 39 forbidden labors that I'm not allowed to do because if I will do it, I'll break one of the pins. Then my, I, the drawing of the energy of Shabbat doesn't come so well. For one thing, this is called Chilul Shabbat, the secret Shabbat. Now again, like I said yesterday, it's not that our sages sat 2,000 years ago in a room and like, okay, let's see how we're going to make them be annoyed. No, they saw in their holy level what do I need to do and what do I need to be segregated from so I'm not going to start breaking these pins, these channels that's through this channel I'm drawing into my system this energy. So really when I want to tap into the energy of Shabbat I have to see what are the rules. What am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? Now if I do 50% of it I'm not saying that it's bad but the necess not necessarily the connection is well. Maybe I'm, I'm cutting half of the connection, so I'm not drawing the energy of Shabbat. And Shabbat has unbelievable energy. That's why I said before, when somebody will come to the shul, he doesn't want to. He doesn't even realize that when you walk into the shul, three hours, you just read some text, you answered a few amen, you, you looked at the Torah, you did a few actions, you walk out, you don't realize how your entire week now is different. You are uh, operating on a different energy. The sad part of this, you don't attribute it to the fact that you were in Shabbat, three hours in the synagogue. You attribute it, oh, the weather's nice, Sunday, a business deal closed. Yeah, it closed, because on Shabbat, you kept Shabbat, you got a little bracha, so the business deal closed. But we attribute it to everything else, but for the fact that I sat three hours in the synagogue. My psychological mind is telling me, yeah, yeah, you wasted your time, you warmed up a chair. So the reality is that when I do a mitzvah, I draw in a certain energy into my system. 
That's why mitzvah in Hebrew, the words in Hebrew, they have a meaning to it. Mitzvah, of course, you can translate it as a commandment, but mitzvah comes from the Hebrew word tzavta. Tzavta is a connection, but a very strong connection, which means that when I do a mitzvah, I create an unbelievable connection, a unity with the master of the universe. So now there's a connection, starts drawing energy. Now I'm using the word energy because that's the word we can relate with. It's not the biblical or, or Kabbalistic term to use. Rather the word that we use is hamshacha, that I am pulling something to me, a certain godly revelation, a certain light. God is compared many times to light. Not because it's looking like this. It's because what does light do? It lights up the room. If there's not going to be any lights here, it's going to be completely dark here. If it's going to be dark, you can't see anything. I will start bumping into things. I can't find my little things. I'm in darkness. I'm limited. Comes a little switch, turn it on, whoop, light now. Oh, now I see everything. I see clear. I know where my stuff is. The same analogy is that Hashem is compared to light. It lights up my reality. Suddenly I see things. How many times you come to a situation and the situation is not clear? You go on a date. I don't know. It's my wife. It's not my wife. She's this, she's that. She's tall, she's short. There's no clarity. Because there's not enough light. I go to a business deal. I don't have to do this business deal. Because I don't know. He looks a little bit crooked. Maybe it's not a good decision. I'm investing a lot of money. What should I do? There's no clarity. And in the reality is that in almost in anything that we do, we don't have clarity. So we start running to the rabbis. Rabbi, tell me, what should I do? Like as if the rabbi is like, has all the answers. Some of them maybe do. But the point is that I can have the answers. Why do I need to run and get answers? Put more light in your life, you'll have answers. You'll have clarity. It's like a dimmer. Dim now the lights, so you'll see a little bit of lights. You'll still maybe move, move around like that. Put a lot of lights, everything is clear. So you put a lot of light in your life, then everything will be clear. You'll go on a date, you know that's my wife, it's not my wife. I come into a business deal, I know what to do. I don't, I'm debating, if should I learn law, should I learn medicine, what should I be? I know right away what I need to be. I want to buy a house? I don't know, this, the, the walls. The... Our entire life is full of uncertainties. Why? Not because something wrong with me. Because there's not enough light to guide me. God is, the, is this light. Now how do I draw this light to me? I have to do a mitzvah. Because the mitzvah is the channel through the light comes from. It can now come any other way. That's why I told you, a mitzvah can be translated to commandment, but a mitzvah is also can be translated to tzavta, to a chibur, to a connection. Now I have a connection, oh, now the information is coming in. And we see we can take all the examples from technology, because technology came not only to make our life easy, but to teach us about godly concepts. So you see in technology that if I don't have any connection, any data, I can't draw information from you and I can't send you information. I can have the most fanciest iPhone 7. If it's not connected to the internet, it's a sophisticated camera. That's what it is. I need to make some type of a connection with the other side. Doesn't matter right now if it's the internet or, 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 or phone, but I have to have some type of a connection. Same thing here. The mitzvah is my connection to the other side. I can only draw this godly light with a mitzvah. There's no other way of doing it. I, I can sit and meditate all day long and chant all sorts of sounds and sit in all sorts of weird positions. It's not going to do anything. People think that they sit for five hours like, uh, something's going to happen. Besides a, 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 a sore throat, it's not going to do anything. That's not how you draw energy to you. You draw energy to you, I said now energy, because energy is, we, we relate to energy as something that moves us. You, you say people have good energy, they have bad energy. That's a, a, a more a, a word, worldly way to, de to describe it. I more call it a godly revelation that comes into my system. So I do that with a mitzvah. So when my life is going a little bit better, I don't attribute it to the fact that a week ago, I gave somebody charity. And I don't attribute it to the fact that I once in a blue moon I put fill in on and some, suddenly something wor is working out. Somebody will come and tell you, oh, you know, the business deal closed because you started showing up to the synagogue. Ah, nonsense. I'm doing it to, to make the rabbi stop bugging me. 
we don't attribute the success to the fact that I actually did a spiritual connection to the bank of energy. I mean, it's called God, but I call it the bank of energy. It's the source of energy. So if I connect myself to the source of energy, then I get, I get this energy. Needless to say, things will start falling more into place. I get more clarity. Relationships start working much better because I don't see the person as an enemy. I see the person as somebody that helps me. You know that most of the problems in marital problems is bad communication and an ego that is out of control. Because if you're looking at the original couple, the first couple, Adam and Chava, or you know them as Adam and Eve, in the beginning, Kadosh Buhu only created Adam. He says, who needs this headache now? Let me just create one. The Zohar says that Adam Arishon, the male face was here, and the female face was here. It was one body. But then Adam Arishon sat on a big chair, and Hashem brought to him all the animals to start naming them. So Adam Arishon was a very holy man. He would look at the animal and say, that's a lion. This is a cow. This is a horse. Of course, the words in Hebrew, not in English. How come? Because he saw the godly energy that enlivens the animal, and he saw the letters, the holy letters that enlivens the animal. So he says, this is Aryeh, a, a, a lion. This is a horse, sus, and everything else, not only the animals. But Adam Arishon got very upset because he was like, how come everybody has mates? All the animals, they have a female and a male. Why come I, I, I don't have one. I also want to have a female. So Hashem told him, trust me, you do not want, trust me, stay by yourself. He's like, no, no, I also want one. It's not fair. And Hashem is like, listen to me, I'm telling you, you do not want one. Trust me. Adam Arishon was pretty persisting. So Hashem said, okay, you asked, I'll give you. <laughs> no, oh, I'll give you one. Up until today, we're paying for that. Oh. <laughs> no. No, I, we can be the women, by the way. You see, you jump right away. It's not good to jump the gun. We can be like, I can take the side of, of the women. I mean, I have a women's school. I'm all for the women. I can say, we is the women. And in Hebrew, it would be more clear. I would say in Hebrew, anachnu meshalmot al ze. So you would say, ah. In English, I say, we, woo. So. That's a nice try. <laughs> <laughs> The point is that men don't even know how lucky they are. Very few know how lucky they are. Now we hear something. Yeah. Now you're <laughs> That's the reality. That's... Anyways, Adam Arishon requested a wife, so Hashem said, I'll give you a wife. And the Torah says, Lo tov al adam liot levado. It's not good for a man to be by himself. Evra lo ezer kenegdo. I will create for him a helpmate that will go against him. He doesn't say, I'm going to create for him a wife. He doesn't say, Nevralo Isha. He says, Nevralo Ezer Kenegdo, a helpmate that will go against him. Which doesn't make sense. Either she's a helpmate or either she goes against him. So the famous commentary on the Torah, Rashi says, if he has the merit, she will be a helpmate. She will help him. If he doesn't have the merit, she will be Negdo, against him. What does it mean if he has the merit? If he appreciates her. If he sees that in his wife, is the mirror that shows him all his faults and he humbles himself and says, oh, that's what I have to work on? Thank you for coming into my life. Then she becomes a helpmate and she helps become, make him become much, much better. But if he has a, too much of an ego and he says, no, she's coming to annoy me, then she becomes against him. So I don't even know how we sidetrack to marriages. Uh, we sidetrack to the fact that we don't attribute success to the fact that I get connected to the master of the universe. And I said that because a lot of the problems of marital problems is they don't value what I have. That's most of the problems with, 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 with uh, uh, marital problems. No communication and no, no value to actually what I have. It's very easy to point the finger and say all the bad things. That's the easiest thing to do. The funniest thing is that the, at the period of the dating, she's the most beautiful woman in the world. She's so handsome. And that's when you date. He's so great. And then after the wedding, 
everything changes. For the month of the dating, he's a prince, he's a genius, she's the most beautiful woman in the world. Look how she waves her hair, you know? <laughs> Two years later, it's like, can you stop waving your hair already? So up until the wedding, everything's perfect. After the wedding, it changes. A, lack of communication, very bad communication, and then an ego that is out of control. The same way that I don't attribute my success and my happiness to the fact that I connected myself to the master of the universe, so I also don't attribute my, my, my success or my spiritual growth to my spouse. So, but this is not a class about marital relations, it's just a, a, an, an example that I do not really focus on the truth and attribute my, my happiness or success to the right place. You know, once in a blue moon, you'll see like a successful businessman that will come up and say like a speech and says, I want to thank my wife for supporting me for all these years. <laughs> you know, he says it once after 10 years. And she's like, now he's saying that? Now? Which was because he wants to get the claps? So the point to take from that is that I do certain actions and I do not attribute the good part to the action. That's why I don't see any benefit in the Torah, because I don't say, oh, I put fill in on every morning, that's why I'm in a good mood. I'm in a good mood because the bank didn't call me today three times. But the reality is that my happiness, which is, we're focusing on happiness right now, mm -hmm. is a tribute to the fact that I'm connected to the master of the universe and my soul is happy. Not, not doesn't matter anything else. What makes me happy is my soul. And the way to make my soul happy is when I connect myself to the bank of energy, to the source of information, to the master of the universe. Just that I have some type of a separation. Why did I attribute that? And I said that it's the same thing with marital relations, with relationships. Because my understanding, where does it come from? It's communication. So I gave you the example with the wire, the plug that has all the 16 pins. If I'm missing one of them, there's no communication. There's no change of data. Like two computers, they talk to each other. All day long, you have millions of computers in the world talking to each other. You go down to a store with a credit card, swipe the credit card, instantly, the computer where you are is sending a message to the other side of the world, to a different computer, to ask if there's credit on this piece of plastic. And to approve, and it goes to the bank, to the institute of the bank, it goes through different institutes, Everything in a split second, and up you get authorization. I can be now here in America and charge my Israeli credit card, and instantly it all works. How? Computers are talking to each other. Now they're not talking with words. The computer's not like, hello, tell me, there's a lot of money on this credit card. It just goes by data, and it goes by information, and the communication is instant. And you're able to reach into different computers, and the computers talk to each other behind the scenes. Millions of them, and it's happening simultaneously all day long. Millions. The problem with me is that I don't have good communication. Why? Because I break these pins, so to say, so the communication is not clear. And that's, I, I, I sidetracked in regards to, to marital relations because the communication is not good. Because I, I broke some type of line of communication. So I, I, I say A, you hear B. Yeah, but I said A. But why are you telling me B? But I didn't say B, I said A. And I saw sometime a, 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 a conversation like that. But it wasn't in a marital relationship, it was just happy, it was funny to see it. I'm standing in the street, and I see a young boy with a beard and a hat, and he's holding tefillin in his hand, and he's stopping a person on the street, and he tells him, are you Jewish? The man tells him, I'm not religious. The boy says, are you Jewish? He tells him, I'm not religious. And they're going backwards and forth. The boy wants to know if he's Jewish to put it filling on him. He doesn't want to put it filling on him. He thinks that he has to be religious to put the filling on him. And they're talking to each other, zero communication. And I'm looking at this back, both sides, and I'm like, what's going on here? He's asking him, are you Jewish? Just tell him, yes, I'm Jewish. Don't tell him I'm not religious. And they're talking to each other, there's no communication. And most, most, most relationships, there's no communication. You say A, the person hears B. He's arguing you about the B. The lack of communication is not because I don't want to communicate. Either my ego is out of control, and I know people do not like hearing that, that they have an ego, but the reality is that we do have an ego, 
And in most cases, it's out of control. Because I think I deserve everything. Everybody else is wrong. I'm the perfect one. I'm the smart one. I'm right. Everybody else is wrong. The other problem is that, that I break these, so to say, channels of communication. So now I don't hear well. Now, when I finally go and do a certain mitzvah, I do not attribute the commandment to the success. Or in this case, my happiness. And like I said before, I'll repeat it as many times as you need to hear. I will only be happy if my soul is happy. If my soul is not happy, I can have five Ferraris and five million dollars in my bank account and everything that I want, I will not be happy. I will drive with a... It doesn't drive fast enough. The house is not big enough. The TV, I just spent ten thousand dollars on it. It's not sharp. And that's coming from one place that the hint is in this pasuk that I told you, because I said, Azim then our mouth is going to be filled with laughter, and my, my tongue is going to praise. Praise and thank. One of the major reasons why I cannot draw this happiness, things don't make me happy because I do not know how to appreciate it. When I praise Hashem, Rina is to praise Hashem. More lehalel is to praise. Rina is like more happiness of, and, and, and of, out of appreciation. My problem is that I don't know how to appreciate what I have. So I look at things in the wrong way. I do not appreciate the fact, yeah, I have this chut to be Jewish and to put filin on. That's why my soul is a little bit more pumped up. And because I did a few good deeds, or I followed a few rules or a few mitzvot, then now my neshama is like, ah, breathing a little bit. It's a little bit easy. Life is a little bit more easy on me. And like I said, I do not attribute it to the mitzvah because I have a problem in communication. And the problem from your communication can, cause many, can come from many different places. One of them from the fact that I'm not willing to attribute a thanks and appreciation to where it came from. We have a serious problem with appreciating and thanking things. So uh, Hashem is going to give me a lot of money, I will buy a $10,000 TV and I will complain it's not sharp enough. Instead of saying, wow, Hashem, thank you so much for giving me Parnasa that I can spoil myself with such a beautiful TV. We, 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 we take all the good that we have and we complain. Hashem is going to give you an unbelievable husband or an unbelievable wife, he snores. He throws his underwear on the floor. She leaves dishes in the sink. That's what bothers you. The reality is that in every situation there's going to be a little bit of good and a little bit of bad. There's no such a thing that's going to be only good. There's no such a thing. Most people, they look at the bad and they focus on the bad and they empower the bad. They don't look at the good and rise and empower the good and ignore the bad. Bad is always going to be. This is the world of good and bad. After Adam and Chava sinned, Adam and Eve, they fell down from their level and they ate from the tree of knowledge. Of course, the Kadosh Baruch kicked them out of Gan Eden, so they're not going to eat from the tree of life. But the tree of knowledge in Hebrew is called Etzadat, but the t Kabbalistic terminology is called Etzadat Tov Vera, good and bad. Because what they brought down to this world is a mixture that good and bad is mixed together. That's why the entire Torah is about separating from the good and the bad. This is the, the, the main theme of the Torah. That's why you see in the Torah, you have kosher, unkosher, pure, impure, permitted, not permitted. That's the Torah. Separating. This I'm allowed to eat, this I'm not allowed to eat. This I'm allowed to do, this I'm not allowed to do. This is tovera, good and bad. Because the bad got mixed into the good with the sin of the tree of knowledge. Bezad Hashem, very soon Mashiach is going to come. We're not going to have that anymore. Because Hashem is going to have avir the power of impurity will be removed. So we're only going to see the good. There's not going to be bad anymore. How do we see it? That right now you'll take an orange. It's surrounded with something bad. You take the peel off. The peel goes to the garbage and you eat the orange. Which means everything is mixed with this good and bad. Something's less. Something's more. Something's it's only bad. That's very obvious. Something it's only good. It's not so obvious. But the majority is mixed with the good and bad. And I have to come and separate the good and the bad. The problem with most people is that they get drawn more to focus on the bad 
and they bring the bad more into effect, and instead of focusing on the good, empowering and pumping up the good, and by default it will overpower the bad. The reality is that this world, till Mashiach comes, is going to be mixed with good and bad. Till Mashiach comes, it's going to be bad. There's going to be some type of bad things in my business, in relationship, in everything that I do. There's always going to be a little bit of bad. The Yetzirah has to come and put some poison in it. But I have the choice of focusing on the bad or focusing on the good. If I focus on the good, then what I do is I empower the good. Then suddenly the good overpowers the bad. And I'm able to overlook the, the good, saying, okay, it's not so great, but okay, whatever, look at all the good. And when a person focuses on the good, he pushes away and diminishes the bad. And the way to focus on the good is to appreciate the good. Most of us do not appreciate what we have. Just the other day, one of our students, my students came, and she told me, you know, my husband is so annoying. And I was like, why is he annoying you? He told me today that even though we have a lot, a lot of problems, I should smile. I said, your husband is a genius. Bring him over, let him teach here in our institute. <laughs> but you know, we, have, we, we don't have money, we just got kicked out of our house, we're not going to have where to live. I'm sick, my husband's sick, this is wrong, this is this, this is that. And my husband is annoying me, he's telling me to smile. And I said, he's very smart, because who cares that you have problems, you still have to smile. And she was like, I can't smile with all these big problems. And I told her, maybe if you smile, then the problems will disappear. But I told her, you know, you, look, how, look how probably annoying you are in the eyes of the Kadosh Boho. You know how much good is in your life? And you don't even appreciate that. You come and tell me your husband is annoying. You know how many women don't have a husband? I told her, drive 15 kilometers where we are. There's a grave there. This grave is called Amuka. All the single people go there to pour their hearts out to get married. This is a very special grave of a very big tzaddik that all the single people go there and they pray there. I thought, let's just go there for one day. People there cry their hearts out. They want to find their other half. And you have a husband. So you're already much better than tens of thousands of women that are single. Or men. And I told them, more than that, your husband is a nice guy. He's polite. He treats you nice. He tells you to smile. You know, many women come to us and tell us, my husband beats me up. My husband cheats on me. Excuse me. My husband does this. My husband does that. I told her, you're lucky. Your husband is nice. So already, you know, you can look at your husband as annoying. Or you can look at your husband as like, he, he doesn't hit, hit me. He treats me nice. And I have a husband. I told her, you know, anything you're going to tell me now, I'm gonna, I, I'll turn it around. Anything. Because the problem is that we see something negative in my life, so I focus on it and I complain. Shem doesn't like people who complain. Shem likes people who turn the other way around and says, Oh, Baruch Hashem, I don't have here, but I have here a lot. And I appreciate what I have. And I, not only that I appreciate, I thank what I have. How many people come to their boss and thank him? Probably. Maybe one or two, actually. I didn't count, so I'm, I'm just saying zero. Because the reality is that most workers, they come to take the check. I don't think workers come to their boss and tell them, thank you. Thank you for hiring me. I appreciate that you, you, you're accepting me to your job and that you're helping me have parnasa. Thank you. Who does that? Most employees, they come and they complain. I want a raise. I need a parking spot. He doesn't appreciate me. I give my heart to the business. He doesn't appreciate me. Say thank you that he even hired you. He can throw you out and get somebody else like that. In most cases. I don't think there are many people who walk into the boss once a month. Thank you. I appreciate that you hired me. How many people come to anybody in this situation? I'm not talking about running our relationships because husbands and wives usually don't thank each other. It's like, uh, take it for granted. You have to cook for me. I don't have to cook for you. It doesn't say here, cook. <laughs> it didn't come in the resume. Who, who says, who made the rule that the wife has to cook to the husband? Okay, uh, you know. Whatever. Anything, yeah. I mean, I know men, usually men are better cooks, but no, no offense. Oh, but, that's true. That's Rabbi, true. Wait a minute. That's true. Uh, no, 
Most of them are men. Uh, I'm not chas shalom saying, I'm say, not go taking you. I'm just saying in most cases yeah, men. men are very good cooks. The point is, we're not going to start fighting who's better cooks. <laughs> the point is that even if the wife stays at home and she cooks and cleans, the husband at least has to come and say, thank you. Thank you for folding my underwear. Thank you for preparing me, uh, the meal to me or for being home or whatever it is. The point is that we don't thank so often. We don't thank it, we just complain in most cases. Very few people have the, the knowledge of thanking. How many kids come to their parents and thank them? Thank you for, you know, I live in your home. I lived in your home for 20 years. Kids just take it for granted. Give me money. I need get money for gas. I need this. Yeah. I need a new phone. I need to do this. What do you look to you like? At least say thank you. And very few people, I mean <coughs> kids, I'm kids, I'm also a kid. I have parents, Bo Hashem. I thank them. After I did Shuvah and my, my, my mind got set well in my brain, I started thanking them. Came to my father and told him, thank you for, for supporting me for so many years. Unbelievable. You're mamash like a, like a tzaddik. You supported me for 22 years. It's unheard of. I, I don't even know how I'm going to repay you ever again. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention your name in my tefillot. I'm going to read Tehillim for you. I'm going to learn Torah for you. You supported me for 22 years. My father was like, <laughs> what's this drug that you're taking <laughs> but that's the reality I'm not talking about the time how many times I apologized for all the trouble they made for them but we don't understand how good it is how what powerful it is to come and thank somebody no offense I'm not saying it to anybody in any bad way but Baruch Hashem I have this hood that many people come to ask me questions and they want my advice or they want my or anything I'm not pointing at anyone but the majority is that 95% of them never even say thank you. Okay, thank you. I mean, they don't say thank you. They just leave. Most people, they don't thank. I mean, not, not that I'm doing it to get a thanks. I, I answer or I uh, take, give my time. Not, I don't need an appreciation. But most people, they don't appreciate. What, you're kicking me out? I'm sitting here for an hour and a half. Yeah, there's other people too. But I have more questions. Yeah, but I gave you an hour, an hour and a half of my time. So most people don't even appreciate that. Very few people come and say, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the fact that you gave me some of your time. And hearing all my, my, my nonsense. And again, I'm not saying it in a bad way. I'm not expecting a thanks. But it's, the po it's a point. It's the concept that, that people do so much for us. And we don't appreciate it. When I don't appreciate it, that's what triggers the fact that this line of communication in my life is get cuts. So if there's a, a problem in communication, then later on, I don't attribute the success or the happiness to the right place. And one of the components, it's not all the components, but one of the components that doesn't allow me to have clear <coughs> communication is the fact that I'm not willing to thank somebody and to appreciate somebody's effort. And sometimes in cases like that, in certain cases, I do not say a thanks because I think that person owes me something. Or that that person has to do it for me. Nobody has to do anything for you. Now I'm not talking right now thanking Hashem. That's a whole different thing. That's a whole lecture in itself. Nobody thanks Hashem. Very few people, I'm not saying Shakon Yabidvaro. That's not thanking Hashem. That's what they teach third graders. If you say Shakon Yabidvaro, you're thanking Hashem. You're not, say that you're not thanking Hashem when you're saying Shakon Yabidvaro, Borem and Amazonot. What you do when you say a bracha is you extract the godly spark that's in the food. That's it. It's not saying thank you for the Kadosh Baruch. When you say bracha achona, bo'one v'ashot rabot, o'al amichya, you are allowing the waste to come out of your body. That's what it does. Based on the teachings of the Ariya Kadosh, when I say shakol niya midvaro, o bo're mine mezonot, people think that, oh, I'm thanking Hashem. I'm saying that Hashem doesn't need your thank like that. What does I do? Is I, I basically dismantle the godly spark that is hidden in the food, and I'm able to release it. And later on at the night when I go to sleep, I take this godly spark out up to its source. Now what happens is, I have food in my body. It has to be waste. If I say, whatever it is, I'm allowing to the dirt, the toxins, the waste to come out of my body. That's why when most people come to me and tell me I have a certain sickness, start saying, why? Because it allows the, the toxin to go out. And Bacha Achona is if you say, now you drink water. 
I finished the cup of water, I have to say, ברוך אתה השם אלוקי נמך העולם, בורא נפשות רבות, וחסרונן על כל מה שברא, אתה החיות בהם נפש כל חי, ברוך העולמים. This is ברכה אחרונה. There's always a first ברכה and a second ברכה. If it's על המחיה, if it's בורא מזונות, then I say על המחיה, ועל הכלכלה, ועל תנועת השדה and so forth. The same, same thing with ברכת המזון. In the beginning I will say, המוצי לחם מן הארץ, after that I have to say, ברכת המזון. There's always a front ברכה and an end ברכה. The last ברכה, the last bracha is to allow the toxins to go out of my body. Go to any doctor or dietitian and will tell you most of the sicknesses because the toxins are in the body. That's why I said before with the headache, you take a Tylenol. The Tylenol doesn't do anything. There's toxins in the body. The blood is intoxicated in some type of a way that it causes me a headache. Or I have some type of toxin in my body, it will come out in a rash. In our generation, you have a rash. You go to the doctor, it gives you a cream. So the cream pushes the, rat, the toxins back into the body. That's it. It didn't yet get rid of the toxins. I know doctors get very upset at me when I talk about these things. But the reality is that they didn't fix the problem. The toxins go back into my body. Now either they'll try to come out from my saliva or my urine or any other way. If it doesn't come out any natural way, it will start coming up. Here I get a rash. Here I'll get a pimple. This, the toxins need to go out somehow. So the bracha achona allows the toxins to go out. That's what it is. So anyone who has some type of physical problem, start saying bracha achona. Very simple. The only thing that we don't say bracha achona on that in something that we derive something out of it is borei mine besamim. If you notice, not because it goes through the nose, because there's no toxins in the smell. If I eat an apple, there's a godly spark that needs to be released out of it, but there's waste that has to go out. So there's a bracha achona. In smell, I only take in. There's no toxins. So I don't have to say bracha achona. I only say borei mine besamim. Or be besamim, whatever I smell. So the thing is that I don't thank Hashem by saying Shakon Niyamid Baro. I thank Hashem when I tell him, thank you. That's it. Most people don't do that. You know when you do it? I told you yesterday when a semi trailer is about to hit you and you're like, ah, thank you. <laughs> but on a day to day basis, we don't thank Hashem. When I get a check, a paycheck, Thank you. <laughs> it worked. I worked for a few hours. I got a, I got a check. I mean, we don't thank Hashem. <clears throat> the point is that I'm not talking about thanking Hashem right now. We have to thank Hashem. One of the points that is making me have such a huge deficiency in my life is that I don't appreciate anything that Hashem does for me. And all it takes is a thank you. Hashem is, doesn't need too much, you know, kissing up. Thank you. And with your words. But that's a whole different thing. Mr. Hashem, once we'll talk about that. But I want to more emphasize the fact that I need to thank you. And I need to thank you. And I think everybody owes me. So why would I thank you? <laughs> that's the reality. People think, you owe me. I came to, to do something for you. You have to thank me. No. I have to thank you. And the more you thank other people, it means the more you acknowledge their, their importance. And the more you attribute... To your success or your happiness or whatever to somebody else, then you're allowed to have a very good line of communication. And whatever you do starts being much more clearer. You know that I can guarantee to you that there are very little amount of parents that thank the kids. Thanks for cleaning the dishes. Thanks for giving, helping me with the, with the bags. Because we think the kid has to, is my worker. Clean the room. Do the dishes. Then my kids don't work for me. So unfortunately in our generation, the kids answer back, you clean it. But, that, but the reality is that I, 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 my kids are not my slaves. That's first of all. Second of all, you know where I learn the most? Not from my rabbi, me. Not, any, me. not from my rabbi. And not from my, well I don't go to YouTube to watch videos. But I don't, my, the ones I learn the most from is my kids. I look at my kids. I observe everything that they do, and I get all my information from my kids. And I attribute that to them, and I thank them. Because kids are real. They're no, no fake. I mean, they might be mean to other kids, they might lie here and there, they might steal here and there, but the reality is the kids are pretty on... Yeah, exactly. Straight to your face. But not only that, kids... Really, our kids came to educate us. I just came to give tools to my kids, 
to prepare them for this horrible world, but the kids came to educate me. So I don't know many parents that come to thank their kids. Thank you. Forget about Ralph, thank you for helping in the house or thank you. I mean, I know, we take it for granted. What? I give you a house, I buy you clothes, I pay your tuition, clean the dishes. But no, I have to thank them for little things that they do. Try that to thank your kids more often. You'll still get a much better response from your kids when you thank them for doing little things. So the point to take from today, because I can go on and on and on and on, is that I have to start empowering the power of appreciation in things that are around me. And when I start appreciating things that are around me, then I'm able to create, start creating very good communication with the person around me. Because the person's like, hey, wait a minute, I'm not a specimen, I'm a, I'm, I'm a spouse. Uh, and I'm not like a, a, like a stranger. You know, just try to one day thank the person in the convenience store and the person in the bank and the whatever it is. The point is that the power of appreciation and thanks allows me to build a very strong communication line to realize that where I'm getting my happiness. Because the reality is that, again, we talked about kind of two different things, but they're interconnected. My happiness can only come from my soul. Purim is next week. Why did I mention Purim? Because Purim has the power to arouse this in me. I can tap into this Black Friday and get this energy that allows me for the rest of the year to carry this happiness, this real happiness, because I connect to my neshama, to my soul. I feed my neshama, I'll feed my soul what it needs to, I'll be flying on cloud nine. Doesn't matter what's my situation in, my, in the world. I'll be able to deal with my problems at least with a smile on my face. I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to be taking two hours to fall asleep because my mind is occupied with so many problems. I'm going to digest my food much better because my stomach is not uh, uh, nervous. People don't understand that a lot of their problems is coming from, the, they're, they're so nervous, their stomach is nervous, they're not digesting things the right way. So a lot of things are interconnected, but the point is that I need to reach out to my soul. When my soul is getting its sustenance and there's a good line of communication, I need to have communication from my soul too. My soul is this poor soul stuck in this heavy body and it can't even talk. <laughs> Imagine being in this world for 70 years and you can't communicate. Imagine these poor people that chasle shalom, they become paralyzed of vegetables and they're sitting like this. Can you imagine what's going on in their mind? Now a lot of times people say, don't worry, they don't feel any pain, they don't feel any, they don't communicate. I know of a person who was a vegetable for a couple of years and when he woke up, he says, I was 100% I, I, alive. I heard everything, I knew everything. Can you imagine being stuck in a body that you can't even go, go like this? A person can go nuts. That's how my soul feels. My soul is stuck in my body. It can't move, can't do anything, can't communicate. Because I don't allow it to talk. I don't allow my soul to move. Just imagine what suffering my soul is going through. And then I'm wondering why I'm suffering. Because my core, me, my me, is suffering. My body is nothing. The body is external. The body is like a coat. It's my soul that's suffering. All I need to do is just feed it a little bit. Try to know it's fast for two weeks. You can't. You know, we just, now this Thursday, we're going to fast for 12 hours. That's it. And however it is not, you wake up at 11. You don't have to fast so much. Once that's what I used to do. I would go to sleep five minutes before the fast, stuff myself up, and then wake up at two in the afternoon. <laughs> fast day, I get to sleep. But the reality is, try to fast for, for, for a couple of hours. You, you start getting all uptight and, and stomach aches. And we're putting our souls on diets. We don't feed our soul. And you don't have to do this. People look at me and they think this is the menu. That's not the menu. You have to give something. Couple mitzvot every day. I mean, I'm not telling you just to do a little. You have to do everything. But you start. I mean, people look at me and they say, no, 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 no. But it, it, this is my choice. The point is that I have to give my soul some injections, something. Five minutes here, five minutes there. I don't have to be super Joe. But I have to feed my soul. And if I'm not going to feed my soul, it's going to be miserable. I will be miserable. And more than that, if I don't have any type of communication with the outside world, nothing will work. And the communication comes, there's different components, it's not the only one, with 
appreciating and thanking. So Bezad Hashem, we should learn to thank everybody around us. We should learn to thank the Kadosh Baruch Hu. We should learn to appreciate everything that Hashem gives to us. We should learn to appreciate what everybody else gives to us. To appreciate my wife and my husband and my boss and my kids and my neighbor and the people in my congregation and anyone I need to have appreciation. When I learn to appreciate, it means in other words, I'm humbling myself. I'm making myself a little bit more humble. If I'm not humble, I have an ego, I'm not going to appreciate what you do for me. I'll take it for granted. Amazad Hashem, Hashem should bless us to have constantly just laughter in our life and happiness in our life and appreciation and love and communication. Amazad Hashem, we should carry this laughter till the second that Mashiach comes because then we'll have the, re the real laughter. But still... Since his wait, I don't know why, it must be a very good reason since Mashiach is stalling his arrival. But in the meantime, I have to do initiate something. So, Bezal Hashem, I wish you all great success and always to be just happy and always to be appreciative and always to be uh, uh, successful in everything that you do. Bezal Hashem, you should have a beautiful week and I wish you already, already a happy Purim and Chag Sameach. If you have any questions, we'll take a few minutes of questions because we got to go, but the rest of the questions we can do tonight.